discuss the long term uh, adverse effects of the view. And whenever you give amphotericin D in terms of long term adverse effects, the first one that should come to mind is the renal toxicity or nephrotoxicity of the drug. Uh, when you give alpha B, you can see a decrease in renal blood flow, and you can see a decrease in glomerular filtration rate in that patient. However, the S is serum creatinine will go up, and the blood urea nitrogen would also go up. And you can see acidosis, or what you call tubular acidosis. And the urine will be scanty. So you get scanty urine or oliguria. And whenever you have oliguria, uh, if you don't manage it, it can actually lead to renal failure in that patient. Isotermia would usually be present, and that's part of why you see the increase in big red or blood urea nitrogen. And uh, as we go along, uh, try to underscore or underline uh, the adverse effects of ample B that are related to hemorrhage, that is bleeding. Because uh, one of the things you will see would be hematuria of blood in the urine as an adverse effect of that uh, agent. One of the ways you can prevent, in fact, the main means by which you prevent that renal failure or nephrotoxicity from occurring is to so-called sodium load the patient. In other words, they give the patient a liter or even two liters of normal saline. Uh, if you give them a lot of sodium, as sodium goes through the renal system, it attracts water and so you prevent that oliguria. If you manage oliguria, you can basically prevent uh, a lot of this CN, I mean, uh, nephron related adverse effects of that drug. So you see with alpha B, you reconstitute it with d 5 but you hydrate or you soak or you so you don't load the patient with the normal saline. So you don't reconstitute alpha B with normal saline, you get precipitation. So that's the main uh, adverse effect that one will remember about long-term adverse effects of alpha B. And then you have some others uh, that will be say related to the GI tract, uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea may be present, uh, anorexia may be one of them in such patients, uh, stomatitis may be present, uh, and then you can see melena which again suggests hemorrhage. That's why the stool will be dark and tiny because of the presence of blood uh, in there. OK. 
then uh, sometimes the patient may uh, experience some uh, difficulty in swallowing or they might uh, have what you call uh, heartburn also. And those are possible uh, GI manifestations of that uh, drug. Dyspepsia uh, and the another one. How does dyspepsia differ from heartburn? What's the, what does that word mean? term for heartburn versus your dyspepsia. And we can give you a hint in terms of indigestion versus heartburn. One is the symptom or can be a symptom of the other. Right? Heartburn can be a symptom of indigestion. So, Electrolyte imbalance. Uh, alpha B can give you a decrease, and uh, your potassium can give you also a decrease in uh, magnesium. Okay. Calcium can also go down when you are using this agent. Phosphates can also go down. So you can have all those electrolytes uh, in balance. Hypersensitivity reactions, you know, the usual from regular rash all the way to anaphylaxis. So all of those can occur in that situation. And then you have hematologic adverse effect. And this is usually just your uh, possi possible increase in blood pressure. And you may also see some tachycardia. The CVS related adverse effects can be prevented if you decrease the rate of infusion of alpha B. And then uh, you can have the pulmonary adverse effects. And that can uh, include um, uh, uh, your respiratory failure. So you see the drug can really be terrible. Uh, you can have respiratory failure, you can have rhinitis. Epistaxis can be present, hemoptysis can also be a manifestation of the pulmonary adverse effects of uh, that drug. Uh, the patient may feel dyspnea, that is dyspnea. CNS-related adverse effects. Uh, those adverse effects can include things like your headaches and hallucination. Those can uh, be uh, present. Uh, 
some men may also be experienced by the patient confusion is another one that may be present. And since the nerves can be affected by apoge, you can also see tinnitus, you know, ringing in the ear. Uh, vision may be impaired, okay, so it can have an effect on the uh, eyes. Vertigo may be present as an adverse effect of, of that drug. And we know that it can produce anemia. And the type of anemia that you get with harmful beauty is the normocytic, normochronic anemia. So the cells will look normal in terms of size, and they will look normal in terms of color. So normochronic, normocytic anemia. And that's the type of anemia that you get in renal failure patients. So it ties in well with the, this renal adverse effect that we talked about. So that's the kind that you see uh, in patients with uh, an who on apotericin B. Okay. So again, make sure you note the ones that are bleeding in the day.
in heavy the what? And what enzyme is that? Okay. So, so it says there's a difference between HMG CoA reductase and HMG CoA synthase. And then you have HMG CoA lyase. So you cannot just say that statins inhibit HMG CoA. You have the synthase, which is which will work here to produce HMG CoA. And then when HMG CoA is produced, then it can be reduced to mevalonic acid. Melalonic. What's the other name for lobastat? What's the brand name for lobastat? Mevacol. That's how you got the mevacol. It's from that meva. Okay. So, and of course, then, this is where your statins will work. HMG CoA reductase. Not here, not the HMG CoA synthase. And if HMG CoA lyase is present, it will actually convert your HMG CoA to beta ketobutyric acid, which is one of your what? As opposed to beta ketobutyro CoA. Okay, so you get your the method 
hospital. And that's the point of diversion. The C14 dimethylanosterol in humans would eventually go to the formation of cholesterol. In the fungus, it will go to the formation of fungal sterol. And so if you have a drug that can inhibit the conversion of rhinosterol to dimethylrhinosterol, then that drug can actually affect cholesterol in humans, as well as sterol in fungus. That's why you can use ketoconazole. That's why you can use it to manage prostate cancer because it can inhibit prominently the formation of this e methyl if you give it at high dose. So even though it's an antifungal, it is also effective in treating prostate cancer when you give a high dose of it. Okay. So uh, the amylamines are the three that I'm listed up there. And the one we'll take as a representative agent will be your tradinafine, which of course is lamisil. That's the representative agent. Naptofen, just basically used for uh, eotinias, that is fungal infections on the skin, or topical infections. The same with your mentax. Mentax is the okay. So those are just used for topical fungal infections. And a moral thing, we put it up there because people always confuse it with your amylamines because of the name. Amorophin is not an amylamine. The amorophin works by a different mechanism. It inhibits your delta uh, 14 and delta 7 and 8. Delta 7 and 8 and uh, by inhibiting the isomerase you know, like the delta 7, 8 isomerase, it can inhibit membrane function. Okay. So, uh, it is not an allylamine, but it is mainly used for tinnias also, that is for, you know, dermato uh, dermatomycosis. So, that's the main reason to put it there. But there's Another drug that you can see as naphtate or aphtate. Okay. That actually belongs to a different class, naphtalmate. But the mechanism of action is the same as that of the amylamines. So your aphtate can be used for athlete's foot, mostly, but can also be used for dermatomycosis. Works by the same mechanism as your amylamines, but it is not chemically an amylamine. Okay. So now we can look at the pharmacology of your uh, lamisil, which is representing the allelamis. So in terms of its mechanism of action, we know that. Uh, Agni, we know that lamisil can be administered PO, and it can also 
also be administered topically because you have a lamisil gel, you have a uh, solution that is the topical uh, solution uh, that you can use. You have also the lamisil spray. There's also the cream, lamisil cream. So it has those um, uh, formulations. Uh, lamisil, when you give it, you want to administer it with food because food can cause a slight increase in its AUC. They were up under the curve. Okay. But it does not, that is food, does not alleviate the disturbance that you get in terms of taste. It does not alleviate the taste disturbance that is one of the adverse effects of lamisil. Okay, it can reduce the incidence of GI adverse effects because lamisil causes a lot of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, flatulence, abdominal pain. You know, it can reduce that, but it does not affect the taste disturbance. And it does not affect the visual disturbance either, you know, which is something that lamisil can produce. And um, if we look at the uh, half-life for lamisil, it is biphasic. You have an initial half-life of about 36 hours. And then you have a terminal half-life, which is long 200 to 400 hours. So that explains the QD administration of lamisil. The usual dosage is 250 milligrams. You do 250 milligrams POQD. And you should advise the patient not to ingest it concurrently with anything that has caffeine in it. So no coffee, whether it's decaffeinated or regular. So no coffee, no chocolate, no uh, caffeinated soft drinks. Okay. Uh, and no uh, acidic uh, fruit or any uh, food that is acidic in nature because that would drastically decrease the absorption uh, of that drug. Uh, it, it has about 70% absorption uh, rate from the GI tract. Okay. And the excretion through the urine is also about 70%. So absorption is about 70% from the GI tract. Urine expression is about 70%. But the bioavailable amount of that drug is only about 40%. And the reason is because it undergoes an extensive forced pass metabolism. You know, the drug can be I transform by your three A four as well as two C nine, two C nineteen. All of those can biotransform that drug, even two C eight can biotransform that drug. So if it undergoes an extensive first pass metabolism, and that's that accounts for the difference in the amount that is absorbed versus the amount that is biologically or bioactively uh, uh, available.
So uh, in terms of the indications for Lagosil, uh, Lagosil should be used mainly for uh, tinnias or for dermato dermatophytes induced infection. Talking about tracospor, I mean tracophyton and dermophyton, microsporin or microsporin, all of those would be susceptible to lung cell uh, activity. So you use it for different tinnias, basically. Newer clinical information suggests that it can be effective against candida also. Okay. But not all candida species. For instance, it is not effective against candida tropicalis. And it is not effective against the glabrite. Remember we mentioned that this candida glabrier is now called torulopsis glabrier. So the funny thing with the clinical study was that yeah it showed some activity against those other candida species, but in vitro it was not uh, effective against any candida species. So what was discovered clinically was different from what was discovered in the lab in terms of in vitro testing of that drug. So we still say that, you know, uh, if you talk about Lancet, basically use it for just dermatophyte induced infections. That's where it is being proven to be you know, excessively active and effective. The uh, adverse effects that one can see with your lamisil uh, we know that it can produce hematologic adverse effects. And so if a patient is going to use Lamisil for over four weeks, you know, a CBC should be done. A complete blood count should be done in that patient. And we know that they can produce some uh, hepatotoxicity. And so in that patient, a liver function test should be conducted if they are going to use the lambda cell you know, for an extended period of time. Okay. And then three, it can produce different forms of your GI adverse effects that we mentioned earlier, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, flatulence, abdominal pain, all of those. So uh, you give it with food, those might be minimized. But again, the taste disturbance, which is one of these adverse effects, would not be affected by food. Uh, then it can have some adverse effects on the skin, mainly rash, pruritus, and your Stevens Johnson syndrome. Okay. Uh, sometimes a carrier also. And the adverse effects of that. Drug.
your systemically administered antifungal agents tend to have uh, this in common, or what we call the glitch. They seem to affect the GI tract, the liver, the bone marrow, and the skin. Practically all your orally administered antifungal agents that are used for systemic purposes. Remember, nystatin is administered orally, but it is not absorbed systemically, so you don't use it for systemic fungal infections. But the ones that you give orally for systemic purposes tend to have the grits as their main adverse effects. Well, that's your lung cell. In terms of drug to drug interactions, lung cell can inhibit. Cyclochrome P four fifty two D six, and because of the inhibition of two D six, it can interfere with the biotransformation of your tricyclic antidepressants. Okay, and 
and I will go all the way to the 11th week. Okay, so day one, four capsules. Day two, three capsules. Two weeks from day one, we started once a week dosing. 150 milligrams once a week. And you go from week two all the way to 11 weeks. That's the dosing for, for that uh, drug. And that's the only tetrazone. And like we said, this mechanism of action will be the same as for the uh, other patients. Okay. The imidazoles are the ones that we step here. Okay, with your maconazole and cortrimazole being the oldest uh, of those uh, azoles. Those are your imidazoles. And many of them are mainly used again for vaginal candidiasis or topical fungal infections. You know, uh, dermatomycosis sometimes would even include your tinea or guillain, that is male uh, infections. So um, the one that really stands out, as I mentioned, is that ketoconazole. Normally you would give ketoconazole 200 milligrams POQD, but if you want to use it for the management of prostate cancer, you use like 800 milligrams, you know, 400 to 800 milligrams on a TRD basis. And that will decrease the production of your uh, hormones by inhibiting the production of uh, cholesterol. If you don't have cholesterol, you cannot produce male and female hormones, you know, testosterone your estradiol from the adrenal gland. And we went through that pathway last semester. I also call that drug an anti-baby drug because it induces uh, erectile dysfunction, it decreases sperm formation, uh, it has some teratogenic adverse effects, you know, uh, it decreases sperm production, like I said. So, Everything along the reproduction seems to be inhibited by that drug. And it requires acidic, an acidic medium for its disintegration and dissolution. So in other words, when you give ketoconazole orally, you know, uh, the GI tract, particularly the stomach, has to really be strongly acidic for it to disintegrate normally and then dissolve and then get absorbed. Sometimes in elderly patients, they will actually make the patient sip a little bit of diluted acid so that that drug, ketoconazole, can work well in uh, such patients. Uh, I'll come back and just mention those that uh, definitely used for uh, vaginal candidiasis, and also those that are mainly used topically for dermatophytes induced infections or topical infections. So, the group that we will take as the representative group for your azoles will be the triazoles. Okay, and these are the triazoles that are available in the United States uh, today. And we will be using fluconazole as a representative agent, comparing it to atraconazole, because those are the two that are most often used uh, in the uh, US. And then we can come back and say a word or two about those that are uh, also available in the U.S. Well, it's, uh, maybe we should just knock those out first. Okay, Taconazole, we know that it's just used for vulvovaginal 
uh, candidiasis. And that's it's uh, genetic indication. All azos, all azos can give you the glitch as adverse effects. All of them, especially when you do systemic glitch. All azos can increase iron, iron R in a patient who's on Coumadin. If the patient is on Coumadin, I will give that patient uh, any azole systemically. You can see an elevation or an increase in iron R. And all azoles, to some degree, can inhibit 3A4. There are some that are very strong inhibitors of 3A4, like your boriconazole, like your etraconazole, like fosaconazole, like uh, fosaconazole right there, and etraconazole up there, um, boriconazole right there, number 10, and your ketoconazole, which is an imidazole. Those are strong inhibitors of 3A4, okay? Medium to low inhibitors of 3A4 will be your fluconazole. Okay? But fluconazole is a very strong inhibitor of 2C19. You know, certain from people 50 to c 19 So it's a moderate to low inhibitor of 3A4, but a strong inhibitor of 2C19. That's your uh, fluconazole. And if you look at this drug, uh, boriconazole, boriconazole can, you can give a normal dose and then suddenly see toxicity in that drug. And there are two reasons for that. One, the drug can start off undergoing your first uh, order kinetics, and then it can just switch to zero order kinetics. Zero order kinetics makes a drug accumulate in the bloodstream, and that's why you can get that sudden toxicity. You know when you are administering even what is considered a therapeutic dose of that drug. You see the same thing with dilantin. Dilantin can do that. It can undergo first order and then switch to zero order, and you suddenly see toxicity uh, in that drug. And if you give boriconazole with, uh, I mean, concurrently with an agent that will affect 3A4 because it's a substrate for 3A4. So if you give the uh, drug with an agent that will inhibit 3A4, then you can suddenly get an increase in the plasma concentration of boriconazole. Okay, so it can be a substrate for 3A4, for 2C9, and also for 2C19. Uh, so that stands out about that drug, sudden toxicity, even though you're giving your uh, normal dosage. The drug can be administered PO or IV. Okay, you can give it PO or IV. If you give it PO, uh, you'll be using something like 200 milligrams PO P12 hours. It's usually administered on a 12 hour basis if you give it uh, PO. And it should be administered on an empty stomach because food tends to decrease the absorption of boriconazole. Okay. Now, if you give it IV, the IV loading dose, you have to give a loading dose of that drug. And you would give about uh, six milligrams per kilogram of boriconazole uh, IV just for one day, but it will be 
two doses, that is Q12. So the two doses for that one day. And then the maintenance dose will be four milligrams per kilogram, i.e. Q12 hours. So you give a loading dose, six milligrams per kilogram, Q12, and then you can give four milligrams per kilogram, Q12 hours. Apart from its effectiveness as an uh, antifungal agent, it's, it's very good for invasive aspergillosis. It's extremely good for that. But it is also uh, good against Fusarium solani. Okay. We mentioned that when we were talking about uh, your polyene antibiotics. Okay. I mentioned that that fungus almost uh, affected the pocketbook of uh, your uh, company that makes a lot of those optimic uh, products because their batches were contaminated by Fusarium solana. But that volcanozole is very effective against uh, that organism. And it is also very effective against Cedasporium. And that is not an easy fungus to, to handle. But fortunately, volcanozole uh, works well. So it's good for astrogelosis. It's good for Poseidon solani and uh, Cetosporium species. And whenever uh, Biffen, that's the brand name, whenever Biffen is administered, you always have to caution the individual about driving at night because it seems to cause what is called night blindness. And it can also produce photophobia, and it can also uh, produce chromatopsia. That would be color. That is, the patient will not be able to tell the difference between certain colors. It's, it use, it's usually chromatopsia for green and yellow. Yeah. But so. It causes visual disturbance, and so you always have to advise the patient yeah, not to uh, not to drive at night. What's point is that? Okay, who's wasting our time? We need to get it up and get out. Otherwise, class is over. Okay, we can rub off taconazole also, because that is just used for vagin vaginal candidiasis. Um, Alpha-conazole we can rub off, not very well used in this country. And phosphoconazole just gets transferred, I mean, the double as the fluconazole, so by itself it is not that uh, often used. Uh, Ephinaconazole, this is mainly used for tinea, tinea on Guillaume. That's what it's mainly used for, but it is also effective against candida. So we can say that it will be used for just dermatomycosis of the nails, particularly toenails. Uh, you can see it as jubilee, brand name, as in a cortisol, mainly used for fungal nail infections. So, we can move that away. 
Casa Bukhanazo, that is a prohibitively expensive drug. You know, uh, isoconazole. Very expensive, but very effective against invasive aspergillosis and against a very deadly condition that is called mucormycosis. Very good for aspergillosis, especially when it's invasive aspergillosis, and it's also life-saving in mucormycosis. And you know, mucor is one of your molds that we list. So, mucor mycosis, this is a fungal infection caused by mucor species. Okay. And uh, you can see it as Crisema, very expensive drug. And uh, it has an unusual strength, if you will. You have the PO and you have the IV. It's 186 milligrams. If you're using the PO, you give two tablets together for on, on day one. Okay, so that would be like 372 uh, milligrams that you would administer, and that will be given for one to two doses. That would be like a loading dose, and then you just give one tablet uh, daily uh, after that. Very good. If you give the IV, it will be 372 milligrams in one vial. So you just give that one vial as the uh, loading dose, and you give it maybe uh, for two doses uh, before you just give 372, that is one vial intravenously uh, on a few day basis. Again, very effective against mucormycosis, very life saving, and very effective against invasive aspergillosis. However, it's very uh, expensive. Um, and your osaconazole is also given IV and is given PO. Uh, again, a very effective drug against aspergillosis, that osaconazole. Okay, you can give it PO. If you use the PO, uh, you can give uh, the drug on uh, a QD to QID basis. Okay. So you can use anywhere from 100 to 400 milligrams. And that can be given anywhere from one time to four times a day. Uh, and then, of course, you can also administer it intravenously, which is about 300 milligrams that you would give. Uh, usually no more than twice a day, if you give it IV. Uh, very good, again, for that invasive aspergillosis and can also cause that visual disturbance. And that's your, what's uh, the uh, Rabuconazole, not commonly used. Yeah, so we don't need to do anything with that. And so now we can talk about fluconazole and ifraconazole. Okay. And if we start with fluconazole, um, the mechanism of action, of course, will be the same for all your azoles, inhibition of C14 dimethylase, particularly the alpha, that is C14 alpha dimethylase. So that 
that will be true for fluconazole, will be true for etraconazole. But in addition to that, uh, those drugs can inhibit the cytochrome P450 system in the fungus, but not in human cells. So that's why you say they are kind of selective. effective against or can inhibit your cytochrome P450 uh, system in the uh, fungus. And that particular one is CP, I see the word cytochrome P450, uh, 51. Now CP51 is what your azoles uh, tend to inhibit. That's a difference, though, between itraconazole and fluconazole in terms of anotropism. So, itraconazole can give you a negative anotropic effect. And that's why one of its adverse effects will be related to the cardiovascular system, where it can actually produce your ventricular arrhythmias called TDP, tosatipon. So that should be capitalized because it's the name of the question actually. And that's the serious ventricular arrhythmia, the life threatening that conazole can cause, but fluconazole does not cause it. Because fluconazole does not produce negative anotropism. So that's one point of difference uh, between those two agents. And um, if we go to the ADME, Um, fluconazole can be administered IV, it can also be administered PO. Maybe we should do this. Let's say this is for fluconazole and this is for itraconazole. Okay. So the same thing for your itraconazole. When you give itraconazole orally, you have basically two uh, formulations. You have the solution and you have the capsule. Okay. And those are not interchangeable because for your capsule, you must administer it with food. But the solution has to be given on an empty stomach. Okay, so they're not interchangeable in that sense. Okay. Uh, the, if you look at the uh, half-life for fluconazole, it is about 20 to 50 hours. Okay. And for itraconazole, it is about 30 to 40 hours. And so generally, itraconazole is administered on a DID basis. Fluconazole you can give on a once a day basis. Okay. Uh, the plasma protein binding is also vastly different. Uh, for your fluconazole, it is only about 11 to 12 percent plasma protein bound. Okay. And so, that's why it can produce dizziness and hallucination and headaches because it can penetrate the CSF region. For your itraconazole, the uh, plasma protein binding is greater than 99%. It's usually given at about 99.8%. So 
it will not produce CNS related as adverse effects compared to fluconazole. Okay. And uh, if we look at the metabolism, uh, fluconazole, we can say no, it is really not biotransformed. But your ethaconazole uh, on uh, undergoes hydroxylation in the liver because of the uh, 3A4. So it is metabolized by cyclopropity 3A4 to its hydroxyl form. So hydroxyl ethra uh, Okay. And uh, even though it's a substrate, it is also a strong inhibitor of 3A4. I will mention that uh, a, a, while, a little while ago. And then excretion. Uh, excretion is primarily through the uh, renal system or your fluconazole. If the patient's pregnant clearance goes down to about 50 mils per minute, you have to reduce the dosage of fluconazole by 50 percent. Okay. And then you can also go out through the breast milk. And so you don't want a nursing mother to take fluconazole. And the same goes for intraconazole. That is mainly excreted through the renal system, but it has a considerable amount going out through the breast milk also, so you don't use it in uh, a pregnant, uh, I mean the nursing mother. at the spectrum of activities. For your fluconazole, of course you have yeasts, you know, candida, uh, and then your crypto, that is cryptococcus. You know, those are yeast, so it's effective uh, against both of those. It has some activity against aspergillus. And of course, again, some um, your dermatophytes, okay, which means it will be effective in some teen years. Okay. And then you can say it being effective in blastomasses, which is one of your dimorph dimorphics. Blastomyces and hepatitis, and it is uh, it can also be effective against your histoplasma, histoplasma capsulatum, and it can be effective against coccidioitis, that is coccidioitis imitis. That's the organism that causes what you sometimes see referred to as San Joaquin River or Valley Fever or disease. San Joaquin Valley disease or Valley Fever is caused by Toxidioitis imitis. And being uh, uh, a dermatophyte, I mean, being a dimorphic you know it will be restricted geographically. So you see that condition mainly in California. You know, the dimorphic infections are geographically restricted. Okay. It is now spreading a little to Texas, uh, but it is mostly found in California. Okay. So that will be the uh, Spectrum for your fluconazole. 
Now, even though it's effective against those, those uh, organisms, you see it used mainly for yeast infections, you know, like in the AIDS patients when you have cryptococcus meningitis, you can see dufloconazole uh, used. And because of that very low plasma protein binding, it gets into the CSF right here. And then you will see it also used in topical infections uh, caused by dermatophytes. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at itraconazole, itraconazole will also be effective against these agents that are within the spectrum of fluconazole. However, it is also effective against Pseudomyceria species. So, pseudomyceriasis you know, can be used in there and it's effective in Leishmania, Leishmaniasis. But mainly your cutaneous type of Leishmaniasis, that is, Leishmaniasis caused by L. tropica. This manas is caused by L. medicana. It is effective in those. And sporotrichosis caused by the sporotrix shen which is one of your dimorphics, can also be treated with itraconazole. In fact, the draconazole was the very first oral agent that uh, was effective in sporotrichosis. The only thing that was effective before the draconazole was amphotericin B. That was it. Uh, if you look at the brand names for a draconazole, you see it there. Sporonox. Okay. It's because of that effectiveness against sporotrix shampi. And sporonox, sometimes you administer it as a pulse pack. Pulse pack. Which basically means you give two capsules, you know, daily. I mean, uh, um, the draconazole is always administered on a BID basis. So 100 milligrams on a BID basis, that's 200 milligrams. Okay. Uh, you give that for one week. Okay. And then you stop for the next three weeks of the month. And then you can start again beginning of the next month if the infection is not clear. That's why it is called pulse, or pulse pack. So you give it for one week, you lay off of it for three weeks, and if necessary, then you start a new month, also for one week. Uh, if it's a serious form of infection, then they can double the dose. In other words, you can give two in the morning, and two in the evening, you know, depending on how serious that is. So uh, that's what we have in terms of the differences when we're talking about um, I'm not sure all of that, but that's okay. Uh, okay. So indications, indications of course will be based on the spectrum. Uh, if you are using fluconazole for vulvar vaginal infections, uh, we know what is always given, just 150 milligrams PO once, and that can be repeated 72 hours later. But usually that one-time dose is enough to clear 
your Muslim flags in Arizona and Texas. If it's for oral candidiasis, uh, esophageal candidiasis, uh, or if it's for prevention of fungal infections during a transplantation, that is prophylactic uses, the usual dose is 50 to 100 milligrams. And that is administered on a PG basis. And as you go up, that is when you get to things like cryptococcus meningitis. Uh, you can see 400 milligrams of your fluconazole being given on a PG basis. So that's for fluconazole, apiconazole, like we said, is always administered on a Q12 basis. You know, and you all see 100 to 200 milligrams given uh, for infections caused by the organisms that are within the spectrum of activity. And the adverse effects. The adverse effect, since they're used systemically, you're talking about glitch. So you can have GI adverse effects, you know, that's the G in glitch, the usual non specific effects. Uh, liver, you can get hepatotoxicity, which fluconazole is very minimal. Uh, you can just get an increase in hepatic enzymes, you know. The uh, minimal, but it can happen. And uh, bones, again, very minimal. You can get some bone marrow depression, but not too pronounced. Okay. And then on the skin, rash is the main thing that can happen. There's some pruritus, and possibly SJS, uh, Sidney's Johnson syndrome. And because of its low plasma protein binding, it can cause some CNS adverse effects, as we see. And the adverse effects of fluconazole will also be the ones for ifraconazole, with the exception of the cardiovascular effect that uh, ifraconazole can produce because of its negative anotropism. So it can produce cardiovascular effects, but it will not give you CNS adverse effects because of the greater than 99% plasma protein binding capability of that drug. Now, drug to drug interactions. All your azoles, whether it's triazole, hexazole, or Megazole can antagonize AMFOB. So they can give an antagonism of AMFOB when AMFOB is being used to treat aspergillosis. So if you're talking about the uh, mold infection, you get antagonism. But when AMFOB is being used to treat a yeast infection, then the azoles are additive. Okay. So in most, they are antagonistic to AMFOB. And by that we mean they would increase the resistance of the aspergillus, that is, of the organism, to AMFOB treatment. Okay. But with yeast infections, they are additive in terms of treatment for that and the valve infections. Um, against drugs like Dilantin, like Bospiron uh, and things like that, uh, they can in interact with fluconazole mainly because of their effects on, on 3A4. So even though fluconazole is not a substrate for 3A4, 
remember it is an inhibitor of 3A4 and it can also inhibit your 2C9. Okay. Now with atrasonazole, you have more drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Okay. One is grapefruit juice. So grapefruit juice should now be administered concurrently with itraconazole. And this is not an issue of waiting two to three hours or separating them at two to three hours. No, if you take one glass of grapefruit juice, that effect, because it affects the OTP, you know, that is your organic canine transporter, uh, polypeptide in the GI tract. It also affects hepatic enzymes. And that effect lasts for a minimum of 72 hours. So it's not like, oh, you can take the drug, just live two hours in between. That does not work like that in the case of itraconazole. You just tell the patient, just don't ingest uh, grapefruit juice while you're on this drug. Okay. So that, that is uh, one, and you know, we'll know the exact reason that some pyrocumarins in your grapefruit juice, you know, uh, they're called bagamotins, and that's what affects that absorption and metabolism. You know, you, you have your seven bagamotins and one, six, seven triangle bagamotins. Anyway, um, but they really affect your paper content. Lower stack, simple stack, those are substrates for 3 a 4 If the condensor is a strong inhibitor of 3 a 4 okay, so uh, it should not be used. The same thing for your uh, benzodiazepines and your phosphorin uh, and your oral hypoglycemic agents and your oral anticoagulants. So all of those can be affected by your intraconazole. Okay, so those are some of the drug to drug interactions involving your um, triazoles. And just in two seconds, we can look at these ones. Myconazole and cotrimazole, um, those can be used for, you know, topical fungal infections and can also be used for vaginal infections. And by topical, that also includes thrush, okay, because you have mycelex, mycelex trochies that you can use for the management of uh, that capital tongue infection. Viraconazole is just vaginal. Uh, Bifonazole never made it big here, so we can leave that out. Viraconazole, we've talked about. Uh, Omoconazole, uh, that's also for like your dermatophilus or like tinea infections. Uh, fenticonazole, that drug is both an antifungal and antibacterial agent. It even works against some protozoans. So it has antiprotozoal, antibacterial, and antifungal uh, activities. Okay. Conazole, of course, is skin or dermatophytes or dermatomycosis. Uh, Tilconazole, just for vaginal infections. Loviconazole, tinea unguium, or onychomycosis, that is uh, nail infections. Oxyconazole, uh, mainly uh, 
used for dermatomycosis. So cortisol, the same, can be used there. And cytocortisol, the same, mainly your uh, dermato, uh, dermato, I mean, dermato, uh, dermatomycosis. And isoconazole, you can leave that out also, not very often used here. Okay. So those are your uh, azoles. And we can leave the skin, I mean, leave the membrane and go inside the uh, cytoplasm where we will find your know, keratin. Uh, keratin is the only inhibitor of fungal protein synthesis that is available in this country clinically. And it's a 5% solution preparation uh, that you use topically. And it is uh, just for dermatophyte infection. And uh, it, uh, so you can use it for tinea, latinia, oblium, and things like that, and all the tinias. The mechanism of action is simply the inhibition of your uh, leucine transfer RNA synthase or synthetase. So leucine. TRNA synthesis. That's what it inhibits. And that's its main mechanism of action. So that's all on Tavaborol or carrying. Okay. It's the only inhibitor of protein synthesis. And that, of course, in the cytoplasm. And then we finally get to the nucleus. And uh, we can look at your 5FC, that is 5 fluocytosine. 5FC, or 5 fluocytosine. You can see that as uncle one. The mechanism of action of 5FC. is that the drug will be converted to 5 fu by the enzyme cytosine deaminase. So 5 c will be converted to 5 fluorouracil So 5 fluorocytosine will be converted to 5 fluorouracil And that's from high school biology, if you want to go from cytosine to urocell, all you have to do is remove an amino and say the group. Okay. And, but this is important because cytosine deaminase is not operational in host cells, that is, in human cells. So there is a degree of selectivity there because you just find that in your fungal. Set. And if we look at the uh, ADME for that drug, uh, we know that it is administered uh, on a PO basis. You would calculate uh, anywhere from 150 to I mean, 50 to 150 milligrams uh, per kilogram, actually. You will calculate how much that is for the whole day, and then you will divide that into four equal doses. That's the way it's administered. Okay. Uh, in terms of its half life, uh, the half-life is initially about three to six hours. 
And if the patient has renal dysfunction, then that can actually go up to 200 hours. So in renal dysfunction, the half-life of that drug, you know, uh, is increased extensively. Uh, the plasma protein binding for your father C is right around 80%. It's about 80. And uh, in terms of the metabolism, uh, well, it has to go to fatty fuel, you know, fibrouracil. And what happens to fibrouracil, we'll discuss under your anti-cancer agents. Uh, it will eventually be converted to what we call football. Five will be better ally. That's what it will eventually be converted to, and then that can be excreted through the renal system. So the uh, indications for 5-fluorocytosine, you can use it against the uh, cryptococcus because it is very effective in managing cryptococcus meningitis. The only problem is that uh, organisms, that is the fungi, they tend to develop uh, resistance to that drug very easily. And so 5-FC is usually administered in combination with your alpha tericin B. So you give alpha B, IV, and you give alpha 1 already for the treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. That's actually the uh, the number one preferred uh, regimen for treating cryptococcal meningitis, especially in AIDS patients. And the good thing there is that 5-FC is actually synergistic with Ampho B. So the azoles can be inhibitory to Ampho B if you treat your aspergillus infections. They can be additive if you're treating uh, your candida infections. And 5-FC is actually synergistic with Apple B uh, in cryptococcal meningitis. And it is also uh, synergistic with Apple B when you're treating serious candida infections. If you have uh, um, Endocarditis caused by fungus and caused by candida. Yes, you can use Uncobon and Uncobon. If you have uh, a serious septicemia, you can use uh, Uncobon and 5 C. If that septicemia is caused by uh, candida. And even in serious uremia, that is caused by candida, you can use Ampho uh, B plus Ampho or 5 FC. Um, let's There is a very colorful, this is chromo, a very colorful fungal infection that occurs in the subcutaneous tissues. That is called chromoblastomycosis. Uh, it can be caused by. Filarosporia species. It can be caused uh, by uh, your uh, consecutive 
five species. Okay. Uh, so, but it affects just the subcutaneous uh, tissues. If you see 5 FC used alone without amphobia, it is mostly to treat that infection, chromoblastomycosis, you know, which means constricted, compactum, the present, uh, causing that infection. So that's the only time you see amphobia used as a sole agent. And the adverse effects that you see with your uh, father C is the same as those that we mentioned under your age levels. The grades, because it's GI, liver, bone, marrow depression, and then the skin. Those, those are his main adverse effects. This is pronounced, the bone marrow depression, and that comes from after being converted to family FE, because one of the uh, rate limiting or, or, or therapy limiting toxicity of family FE is bone marrow depression. So it can uh, produce that. And the last agent that we mentioned is the glucophobia. Glucophobia. And glucophobia, of course, is an antibiotic uh, that was originally produced by a penicillium. Penicillium presactum. That's the original source of your presophobia. And the mechanism of action uh, is the inhibition of mitosis in the fungal cell. Presophobia is actually fungistatic, it is not fungicidal. Static. So it's an anti-metonic drug. Uh, in terms of its ADME, the drug is administered orally. And if you remember Greece, as in Greece forming, then you know that has to be administered with fatty food. Okay, or greasy food, uh, it increases its AUC tremendously. So it's supposed to be given like that. Uh, you know, the, uh, the half life of uh, your glucophobia is about 36 hours. So it is long past. And the plasma protein binding is also high, uh, of course, of the 90s. Uh, you have metabolism in the liver. It can undergo demethylation. And then it can also undergo glucuronidation. The liver and the metabolites are actually uh, excreted uh, through the uh, renal system. The drug tends to concentrate in the horny layer of your skin. Okay. And it also concentrates in the uh, layers of the nails which is very helpful because 
It is an orally effective agent for the management of tinea or goya. Okay. Spectrum wise, extremely narrow. It is only effective against gametophytes. So if the oligomycosis is caused by candida, you cannot use chrysoformin. It is only effective against gametophytes. And the indication, of course, will be tineas, be it tinea gleum, tinea pedis, tinea corporis, tinea capitis, you know, just tineas. Uh, that's uh, what it is used for. And you have two formulations. You have one that is ultra micro formulation okay. and one that is just micro formulation okay. and you can see it as resacting or you can see it as formicin So you have presaptin and then you have presaptin ultra. Okay. So presaptin regular will be your regular micro formulation and then presaptin ultra will be your ultra micro formulation. But focusing UF Ferguson UF is not an ultra micro preparation. That was one of the questions on the external exam. And because you see you there, you think it's ultra, but Ferguson UF is actually uh, a micro formulation. The ultra micro is Ferguson PG. That is an ultra micro formulation that we are focusing. And then you have the satin pair, which is PEG. You know, uh, polyethyl glycol, which always enhances the pharmacological effect of drugs. Like you mentioned, paid intron. There are other examples. So the second peg is another one where you combine polyethyl glycol with the drug and then you get an increase in the effectiveness of the drug. Um, so those are indications for your uh, gisophobin. So how long you use it depends on what you're treating. If you're going to treat fungal infections on the nails, you might have to use it for up to six months. You know, uh, whereas if you create and say, tinea cruris, you know, jump each, you can just use it for like two to four weeks. And that will be okay. Adverse effects that you get from Christopher again, glyphs. Okay, all these glyphs you cause. But there's one that stands out that is called ID. You know, ID um, eruptions. So these are things that we we'll see on the skin, and it is due to the body's cell-mediated immunity (CMI), cell-mediated immunity against that offending dermatophyte even after you have successfully treated the condition with chrysophobia. So this horrible rash is just break out. Uh, it's called uh, ID eruption. It's something that stands out about chrysophobia. And of course, some uh, some photosensitivity. We also the same. 
with that drug. All right, we'll pull it there. Any questions? Thank you. 